and lifestyle. And this week, we're, we're kind of moving into the next phase. Of like, not only how do we have this type of culture internally, but externally as we interact with this world, as we interact with Providence, as we interact with Rhode Island, as we interact with our neighbors and coworkers, what type of culture should we have with this world that God has put us in? That's what we're going to be discussing for the next four weeks as we go through the guiding principles. And the first one we're going to look at is the role of being a citizen, a citizen uh, of God and a citizen of this world. And we're going to start with reading a passage from Jeremiah chapter 29. And out of reverence for God's word, let's stand for the reading of the scriptures. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We have one as a gift for you at the Welcome Center. So after the service, feel free to grab one, and it's yours for keeps. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29. The verses will also be on the screen. This is God's Word. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconi and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, and the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisai, the son of Japhon, and Jeremiah, uh, Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It is said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage uh, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would teach us your word. We ask that we would love you more deeply because of these things. We ask that we we would understand, we'd live it out, and we'd understand what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be in this world and and bring welfare to this world and and to love our neighbor as ourselves. These are things that we cannot do in our own strength. These are things that we cannot do without your grace, and we ask for it. Uh, We also pray now for all the other churches and Christians in the city and in the state that we could do these things together. And we, we are not so prideful to think that we could do this on our own, but we know that you are doing something in all the churches across the entire world, and we want to join our brothers and sisters lifting you up, both in word and deed. Amen. You may be seated. As I said before, we're going through our guiding principles, and we're on the one of citizen, and, I, and something I haven't done Uh, for any of these is actually read the definition from the guiding principles that we're going through. You know, if you you have one of these booklets, if you got one of these, if there are some for you at the Welcome Center, if you didn't get one, there's a little definition for each one. And just for the sake of brevity, I haven't read each one that we've gone through. But for this one, I want to read it. And I want to read it for a particular reason. This is what it says for citizens. We value tangible involvement in the city. Christians shouldn't, uh, should be good neighbors, co-workers, and citizens as a way of loving others. We desire to seek the peace and prosperity of providence. Now, the reason why I wanted to read that is because of all the different core values and guiding principles that we have, of all of them, this is probably the one 
that the average person would be like, I really like that. <laughs> you know, if we went and just took them and started to read some of them to people on the streets, I think the average person would be like, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good thing. I could sign on for peace and prosperity for the city. I could sign on to being good to your neighbor. I could sign off on all of that. It, it's a generally, people think it's a good thing. But as I started going through uh, some key passages when it comes to this, and as I started to think about, well, how do you actually do it? More and more, it was like, yes, everyone agrees, but we really have a hard time doing it. <laughs> you know, it's easy to understand, it's easy to agree with, but actually living it out is a complete other story. It's, it'd be like at a Miss Universe pageant. Not that I've ever watched one, but it's like, you know, the, the trope of what if you could do anything in this world or if anything could change, what would you do? What is the one thing that you would wish for or whatever, something like that? And what is the, the trope answer? World peace. Okay. It's, that's the trope answer. It's like world peace. And everyone applauds and everyone shakes their head. Yeah, that's really good. Even Miss North Korea is clapping her hands of like world peace, you know. It's like every, everyone's clapping their hands, but it's like, well, if everyone's clapping their hands, why can't we get it? You know, why is it such a struggle? <laughs> it's like everyone understands, yeah, that's a pretty good thing. We should be good to our neighbors. You know, it's a pretty good thing. We should be you know, good citizens. Yeah, it's a good thing. We should seek peace in our, in our day and age. But it's like, well, there's an issue because although we're all shaking our heads, like it's not happening. And one of the reasons, there are a lot of reasons for this, but one of the reasons is all of these things are good, and we understand that they're good, but it's so easy to kind of fall off the rails. Or to use a car analogy, I, have, I, um, I would just want to show that uh, Lexi is not the only one who can, can use art to illustrate things. Um, so this is, I didn't actually make this, I stole it from the internet, but it's like, but I did, you'll see this image again in the message, and I did put text over it. So there's that. So it's kind of like we're, we're driving down the road, and for every road, there are two ditches, right? That's how roads work. For every road, there are two ditches. And when you go out and you're trying, I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to be a citizen in this world. I'm going to be involved in people's lives. It's so easy to have that zeal and have that desire but, and then drive straight off the road. So what we're going to look at are, are four different ways that we are citizens. What does it mean to be a citizen? And then through each one, kind of uh, understand what that means by pointing out the ditches. Okay, what does it mean to stay on the road and do this? Okay, well, avoid that ditch and avoid that ditch and just keep on driving on the road. So these are the four things we're going to look at. Citizens make things better. Citizens make things better. Citizens lead people to eternal life. Citizens silence critics. And citizens love the least of these. Okay, the first one. Citizens make things better. The, the text that I read from Jeremiah 29, this is the context. This is about 2,500 years ago. The people of God, is, the Israelites, had been taken over by Babylon. The Babylonians came in and they decimated Jerusalem and the entire country. And what they would do, and this is not just with the Israelites, they would do this with all the nations that they conquered, is they would take a lot of their people, especially the top percentages, you know, like those who were leaders, those who were artisans, those who had skills, and they would take them and they would steal them and they would bring them back to Babylon. And this was their strategy. Yeah, different empires have different strategies of conquering people, but this is their strategy. And one of the, their goals was we're going to make their most skilled, their most talented, their best leaders, the best and the brightest, the cream, the cream of the crop, we're going to make them Babylonians. That was their goal. And the Israelites, the, the people that are in exile, find themselves in a place where they know they're in Babylon to become Babylonians. They know that's the stated goal. Like, they're not stupid. That's why they're there. And there are false prophets, false people that are uh, saying that we represent what God says. And they're teaching the people, hey, uh, buckle down, don't interact with the city, Retreat, get out of this, this, this place, because we're going to be saved really soon. We're going to be taken out of this really soon. 
in Jeremiah, in this portion of Jeremiah, it's actually, it's, you can tell it's edited because there's a little bit of an intro and then it's like quote and he's quoting the letter. So he's like, this is the situation. And then they put the letter that he sent to the people saying, correction, the people that are telling you this, they're wrong. They're wrong. This is what God actually says. This is what it, God is actually communicating to his people. So in Jeremiah 29, verse 5, it's like, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, uh, get married, have kids, see that, you know, have grandkids, see that your kids get married and they have kids. And then in verse, not, or excuse me, in verse 7, it gives kind of a summary statement of what he's getting at. And it says this, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So it, what it's saying is, you know what? You're in Babylon. They're bad. They're, they stole you. They just, they, it's like, it's not sugarcoating how bad Babylon is. But it's like, while you're here, seek the welfare of it. Be a part of it. Bless it. Pray for it. And this is what he's saying to his people. And I think, humbly, this is what we should be trying to do as well. Now, some people would be like, wait, 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 wait a second. This was written to God's people 2,500 years ago in a very particular situation. And you're right, it is. But if you read through the New Testament, there are several times where God's people are referred to as exiles. And in fact, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1.17, Peter, the, the lead apostle, lead follower of Jesus. He's a leader in the early church. He says, throughout your time of your exile, he's, he's talking to uh, the, the church, the early church, and he says, throughout your time in the exile, he uses the same language in reference to their situation in the same way that it was referred to in the time of the exile in Babylon. So when, when the early church, especially those who grew up Jewish, they knew the stories, are, they're referred to as exiles. They, are, they know, they already have a storyline in their head of what it looks like to be an exile and what it doesn't look like to be an exile. And it's applied to the church of like, now you do that. You live like that. You live the way God commanded his people to live when they were in exile in Babylon. So what does that lifestyle look like? Well, in short, it looks like making things better. <laughs> it's like, it's a very simplified way of putting it. Just make things better. Uh, so, for example, when you go to work, do you make things better? Are people glad that you work for the company that you work for? It's like, are, are, you, are you glad? You, I'm glad I have that coworker. I'm glad, they have, you know, it's like, I'm glad, that, you know, uh, in your, your neighborhood, are people glad that you're their neighbor? I'm glad they're my neighbor. You know, everyone has, in some time in your life, has had that neighbor. Like, are you that neighbor? Are you that neighbor? <laughs> you know, it's like, what, what kind of neighbor are you? Are you is, it, is it making the neighborhood a, a, a better place? Or just and, and all the different relationships, even in small interactions. You go into a coffee shop and you order a coffee. You go to get your oil changed and, and you get your oil changed. Whatever, whatever it is. Is it hey, your presence? Is it making things better? And as we go about doing that, again, that's the road. Citizens driving down the road, we're making things better. There will always be two ditches. There will always be two ditches. And it was the same two ditches that were in front of the people of God in Jeremiah. The first one is to retreat. To retreat. You know, these false prophets are like, oh, we're going to get out of this really soon. Don't be involved. Get out of the way. Get, just make sure you're not tainted by Babylon. You know why they brought you here? They brought you so you would become Babylonians. And it's just to not interact with the world. Not interact with the world. Just completely get out of it. You know, just try to find ways to not know people or to not be known by people. And the, but the other way is to completely assimilate to become Babylonians. Okay, they brought us here for that purpose. Might as well. <laughs> it's like, might as well become just like everybody else. And God has instructed us to do neither of those things. Neither of those things. 
We, we can't assimilate. We can't become just like the, the world, nor can we just retreat. And we can't do it not just because God told us not to. We can't do it because it actually doesn't work. It actually doesn't work. If you try as genuine, if you're genuinely a Christian and you just go into the world and try to be like the world, you'll feel like a fish out of water. You know, I, for, for years and years and years, uh, I, you know, used a lot of analogies from that time when I led in a, in a college ministry, and I would always hear people say, man, I became a Christian, and then I went back to a party I used to always go to, and I just couldn't do it. And that's, you know, the reason? Because they're a fish out of water. <laughs> it's like, you can't, you never feel like you're actually, it's like, you just can't do it again. You can't fully assimilate. So you're, you're just like something half-cooked, you know, you're not raw, <laughs> You're not fully cooked. It's just kind of, uh, nobody wants to touch it. It's, it doesn't actually work. But you also can't retreat either. Because you know what? Wherever you are, you are. And some of the world is not just outside of you. It's in you. You know, we all have indwellings. Even when we receive the Spirit of God, God saves us and He gives us a Spirit, changes us from the inside out. But we all have what the Bible calls indwelling sin, meaning sin we're still struggling with. You can't run from that. And you can't run from that both in yourself and other Christians. You know, I think, I think pretty highly of, of our church. I think pretty highly of you guys. But, like, I'm not stupid. <laughs> we all have a lot of sin. It's like we all have a lot of issues. We could spend this entire time and then some just standing up and sharing all of our issues. And that would not be encouraging at all. But we, it's like we, we can't actually retreat from that. If we all decided to move to Montana, I have a friend that he, his dad is a rancher and he owns a ranch. He has his own mountain. There's a mountain on his ranch, which is nuts. We could all like call him up. Wesley, can we just move to Montana on your mountain? <laughs> you know, it's like we could, but you know what? As soon as you got there, it would take a week, and you're like, wow, there are a lot of issues. Who brought these issues here? It's like, we did. You cannot retreat from that. So what are we supposed to do? We stay on the road, and we make things better. And the, the protection, the protection from both of those, from assimilating and from retreating, here, here's the secret sauce. It's love. It's love. When you love someone, you don't assimilate. Because in loving them, you, you want them to see what is killing them. And when you see what is killing them and you love them and you're trying to help them get out of it, that, that what is killing them is the least attractive thing possible. Does that make sense? It's like <clears throat> when you see someone uh, about to be hung and the noose is around their neck and you're like, I'm going to save them, I'm going to save them. There's nothing attractive about the noose. You know, it, it's, it, it provides a protection. Love provides a protection. It also provides a protection from retreating. Because how could I leave these people? How could I leave? You know, I love these people. They're my friends. They're my neighbors. This is my city. They're my coworkers. Obviously, God sometimes leads people to go in different directions. I'm not saying that that is never the case. We see that in the Bible as well. But love is what keeps us on the road from these two ditches. So we, citizens, in conclusion, make things better. Secondly, citizens lead people to eternal life. Citizens lead people to eternal life. This is what Jesus says in the most famous sermon of all time, the Sermon on the Mount. He says in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth, but if a salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So this is the analogy he's making. He's like, my people, he's talking to his disciples and then the crowds that are listening in are like salt. And salt in ancient times would do two things. The first is the same thing it does for us. It provides taste. Okay. The second is it would, be a, uh, it would preserve so you'd put it on, they, don't, they didn't have refrigerators, they'd put salt on it, and that fish would last a lot longer if it was covered in salt. And same with other types of meat, they would use it as a preservative. And he says, but if it loses its saltiness, and saltiness doesn't, um, 
it doesn't like lose the, its elements. What it does is it gets contaminated. So as other things get mixed into the salt, the, the saltiness decreases its effectiveness, and then it gets to the point where it's just useless. And he's like, if that happens, then it's no longer useful. So uh, what salt needs to, to be useful, it needs to keep its, uh, its element. It needs to keep its saltiness, and it also needs to be applied to whatever it is it's supposed to preserve, or it needs to be applied to whatever it's supposed to add taste to. And then he moves his analogy on to light. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the people. So he's, he's making the same analogy, same point, with a, excuse me, with a different analogy. He's saying light, again, light brings light to darkness. <laughs> so that's what it does. But if you have a light and you cover it, is it going to do anything? No. No. So the two things you need, you need the light to actually be there, the substance to actually be there, and then it needs to be applied. It needs to be visible, like the light of a city or the light on a stand. That's the thing. It's like if you're walking through, I don't know if you've ever been camping and you're out at night and you're trying to walk a trail and one there's one flashlight for a group of people. And every time that guy or, or gal does not know how to use the flashlight, you know, the flashlight is everywhere except where it would be useful. And where it would be useful would be at your feet so you can see the trail. But the same, same principle is you might have the light, but if the light is sh shining on someone's back or the light is shining up into the trees or the light is shining at, at themselves, you know, it's like it doesn't help. It needs to, the light needs to be on and it needs to be pointed in a direction that actually brings light. And then this is his summary. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see the good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So God's people, the church, we're, we're supposed to have a certain type of substance, and then we're supposed to be applied, applied like salt or shining like light in a certain direction. So what are the two ditches? If that's the case, if that's the analogy that Jesus is making, these are the two ditches that we can drive off into. We can be applied but not pure. You know, we're present, we're shine, you know, shining, but the, the light is obscured or the salt has lost its saltiness. Or we can be pure but not applied. The light is shining as bright as it possibly can, but it's covered. It's very, very salty, but there's no fish to be seen. It's just sitting there on the table, not providing salt to anything. Those are the two outcomes. And both need to be present. Both need to be present. It doesn't matter if you put yourself in a, in a place to know and love your neighbor that if, if you talk exactly like them or if you have the same attitude. It doesn't matter if you put your, yourself in a place where you can really get to know your coworkers, but you complain just like they complain or you gossip just like they gossip. It doesn't matter. It and so it's, people can be like, I'm being so missional right now and, or whatever. And it's in, the, in fact, they're just, just like everybody else. Nobody notices the difference. But the same, it's, it's also not effective to be like, I never gossip because I don't have anyone to gossip to. <laughs> it's like, that, that, that doesn't work. You actually, even if, you, even if there is a difference in substance, if people don't see it, people don't see it. So it has to be seen. Now, I have to say this. I have to say this in our day and age when it says they mu this, it must be seen, the good deeds must be seen. This is not just some PR move or, you know, I'm going to make sure my socials are just filled with me volunteering at different places. This is not that. I'm not saying that's even wrong. It's not wrong to have an aspect of that, and you can have a platform in that way. And But this is way more than that. This is the people that see you most. What do they see? And who are those people? Like in a, in a way that really does affect things.
So again, not it's it, social media isn't bad. I'm not against that. But it's more, way more than that. And it, we've entitled this series, What Builds the Church? What Builds the Church? And one of the reasons we title it this is Jesus promised to build his church. And he uses different materials to build. He's a master carpenter. And he knows exactly what materials and exactly what tools to build. And this is Jesus communicating, these are some of the tools. These are the tools I use. Your good works. People will see it and they'll respond to it. They'll see it and they'll respond to it. Now, and I'm going to share a little bit more about this in in the last point, but I want to state it right now so it's very clear. This is not just uh, what you do externally by way of good deeds, as in, you know, giving someone water or giving someone a ride or giving someone uh, being generous financially with them or inviting them over for, for dinner. This good deeds is not just what you do, but it's also what comes out of your mouth. That, that is a part of good deeds. So if you're just doing a lot of good things and people aren't hearing the truth of the gospel, well, then they're going to misinterpret what you're doing. Sometimes what we think we're communicating is the gospel of how Jesus saves sinners. But what we're communicating, because they don't connect it with the gospel, is actually a false gospel of just be a good person like me. And that's not that doesn't help anybody. In fact, it hurts them. So a part of the umbrella of good deeds is not just what we do, with our hands, but what will you do with our mouth as well? It's a bigger umbrella. And when we share with our mouth the good news of how Jesus died for the sake of sinners so that we might know God, when we share that with our mouths, they, they understand how to interpret our good deeds, what is actually going on. Not, I guess to be a a Christian means to go to church occasionally and just be a little bit cleaner than ten percent cleaner than everybody else. That's not the message. But when you share and do, what it communicates is God loves people, <laughs> you know, and He's awesome. Not me. You know, we're gonna have a, a baptism this morning. Naira's gonna get baptized, and I think you know we'll see. How if everything comes to fruition, I think this summer we're going to have around 10 baptisms over the next months. And again, we'll we'll see if everything comes to fruition. But I was reflecting on this. I don't know. I've heard a lot of baptisms. I don't know how many, but a lot. And there are some things that are very different. There are some things you'll hear in Nayara's story that are very different from your story. Next week, Connor's going to get baptized. There are things in his story that you'll hear that are very different than your story. But there are some things that are very consistent. The grace of God being one of them. Seeing, seeing your sin, responding to the grace of God being another. But one thing that's very consistent, with few exceptions, is the love of God's people. You know, yes, there are some people that just find something on YouTube and become a Christian or find a Bible at a hotel and become a Christian. And that's good. And that's glorious. But for the average person, a very large percentage, it's, I saw the love and care of other people. Or I saw the love and care of this person. And what is that? Well, that's exactly what Jesus is saying in this passage. I'll, I'll read it again. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. They see it and they, they connect it with a certain truth of who God is. And then they turn to God and it's no longer you and them, it's them and God. And they give glory to God in heaven. That's how it works. Over and over and over again. So what does it mean to be a citizen? It doesn't mean to be applied and not pure. It doesn't mean to be pure and not applied. What it means is to lead people to eternal life because they see your good deeds and they know who gets the credit. God. The third one is this. Citizens silence critics. Citizens silence critics. I want you to imagine you're walking through the woods and you hear meowing 
and it's not just meowing of you can tell the difference between uh if you if been around cats at all like a meow that's normal and a meow that's scared or hurt or angry same with like parents you can tell the difference between when your kids are actually hurt and when they're faking it you know sometimes if you're sitting with other people that aren't uh, parents or they're not parents of your kids you'll hear bloody murder in the other room and you're not responding, but they're like, this is the worst parent ever. What's going on? And you're like, that's fake. That's not a fake. That's not a real one. <laughs> it's like, just wait a few seconds. It'll be fine. Yeah. Let's say, so you're walking through the woods and you hear a meow and it's a scared meow and it's an angry meow and you start to follow it and you look down and in a big hole, there's a, there's a cat. It's all wet and sturdy scared and you're, you're thinking you know if i reach down i could just barely get a hold of that cat so what you do is you reach down to grab that cat and you grab a hold of that cat and you have to hold pretty hard if you're going to be able to it's it's wet and slippery you have to hold pretty hard on that cat and you lift the cat up now nine times out of ten what's going to happen to your arm when you lift that cat up it, it, your 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 forearm is going to get shredded for sure because cats are evil. That's my point. Cats are evil. <laughs> dogs dogs are good. <laughs> That's the point. Okay, but it's like nine times out of ten. I'm just kidding. I know people like cats, but it's like you reach down nine times out of ten. That's what's going to happen. Sometimes Christians are really naive, and they think if I go around helping people. If I go around being a good neighbor, if I'm a good coworker, you know what's going to happen? People are going to love me. People are going to be so stoked about me. And they're like the person being like, oh, what a cute kitty cat. And you reach in and then you come out and your forearm, you know, it's just, it's the way it is. And people are shocked. People are shocked that that happens. But it happens all the time, all the time. Or have you ever heard of an intervention when somebody's struggling with alcohol or drugs or whatever, and you get people that love them together, like genuinely love them, and you have an intervention. You're like, hey, we're just worried about you. You know, they, I don't know, I haven't seen any real stats on how often it works or how often it, there's a breakthrough, but there, you know, oftentimes there's not, <laughs> you know, instead of like, you know what, all the people that love me, you're right. That doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes all, you know, all those that say they love me, you're the worst. You know, that's, that's sometimes what happens. And we know that because there have been times where we were that person. <laughs> you know, we know that because at times we were that person. So he, here are the two ditches that we can fall into when it comes. We go out and we start loving people. And it's the, the two ditches of understanding. This is just the way people think. People never hate Christians. If I go out and I love people, and it's just, I'm going to be everyone's best friend. And the other ditch is people always hate Christians. <laughs> you know, people are just going to hate me all the time. And uh, and the verse that kind of cuts through the middle and keeps you on the road. There are many verses, but here's one. It's First Peter two twelve, and it's it's so good. Right down the middle verse, it says this. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Gentiles here is used to mean unbelievers. It's, uh, just by the context, we know that. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, notice it says when. When they speak against you, it's going to happen. They may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of his visitation. So you go about and you're doing good and you're loving people. This is bound to happen, bound to happen. Somebody's going to see, you know, you, you run, this is an extreme example. You run into the build, burning building and you're dragging someone out and someone's like, I don't like the way they run. You know, it's like whatever it is. It's like, it's going to happen. There's going to be some criticism. And this is why Peter's saying, make sure your conduct is honorable because people will be looking for something. And sometimes, we'll be honest, sometimes they'll find it. That's a, a genuine critique. And for those situations, we should just repent. Be humble. I was wrong. But even when it's not that, even when it's like truly, you know, you're just trying to help. 
There will be that. There will be a criticism that comes when it comes. But Peter's uh, Peter's exhortation is, don't worry, people will see your good deeds. And just like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I was there, guys. I'm writing you this letter. First, P- Peter is Peter writing a letter. I was there. I heard the Sermon on the Mount. And people will see your good deeds. And some will glorify God. Now, here's a big confusion that people have. Sometimes we think every time it's going to be the same person. Meaning the person that was criticizing me will see my good deeds and then they will glorify God. And sometimes that is true. Sometimes that is true. Sometimes when you respond to people um, being angry with you with kindness and love and patience, they will see it and they'll respond. But oftentimes it's actually not that. It says in Proverbs, uh, strike the fool and make wise the simple. Meaning sometimes the, the fool you're correcting is actually making wise the person over here just watching. And in, in life, oftentimes it'll be that. There's criticism coming. And what the person most affected is the person that's just watching what's going to happen. Here's an example. Um, there is, let's say, go back to the gossip in a workplace situation. It's a very common thing. And let's say that someone is starting, you know, someone leaves the room and that the person is like, hey, did you hear? Okay, there's you and another coworker. And you're like, you know what? If, if you want to say it, you can wait until Susie's in the room, but I'm not going to be a part of that. Okay, now that there's a good chance that the person that said, hey, did you hear is not going to be happy with you. Okay. And there's a very good chance that you might get some pushback for that. Very good chance. But the other person that's just there, there's a good chance that they will think, I can trust that person. (laughs) Does that make sense? That's often how it works. That's often the the, uh, when people are seeing the good deeds of the saints as we try, by God's grace, to reflect who he is. And person A is, is, is saying, they're horrible, they do this, they do that. And then other people are like, I don't know. I've been watching. That doesn't seem to be the case. I don't think that's true. Or, yeah, they're not perfect. You know, then nobody's perfect. But these accusations just don't land. Oftentimes, it's this other person that is watching. And as that happens, people see who God is. And they respond to who God is. And they, too, become Christians, or they too are more open than they've ever ever been before. You know what? I might check that out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and then they start to take steps in checking it out. I'm currently reading a book called Anti-Fragile by uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And the whole premise of the book is that there are some things that are fragile. Like if you throw a teacup against the wall, we all know what's going to happen. It's going to break. That's going to happen. Uh, but there are some things what are what he calls anti-fragile, meaning when they come under stress, they actually grow. They actually become stronger, not weaker. And here are just a few examples. Your immune system is anti-fragile. If you decide that you're just going to stay in your home, and if whenever you go out, you're going to wear gloves and you're going to wear a hazmat suit or whatever, whatever, whatever it is, and you're not going to interact with people, and you never, it's like if anyone re- says anything of like, hey, once last year I was sick, you're like, get away from me. You know, it's like whatever it is, uh, what you're going to find is your body it will actually be more fragile, not less, because that's the way immune systems work. Amuse, immune systems get strong by getting a little bit sick, a little bit sick, a little bit sick. And as that happens, your immune system gets very strong. So your immune system is anti-fragile. Okay? The, the same thing goes with plants. Ke- Kevin was telling me how they're, they planted little seeds in their basement and they're waiting to bring them out. And one of the things that you do with those seeds as they sprout is go, you go down and you blow on them or you, you put a fan on. And the reason is plants... Uh, from trees to little seedlings is they need the pressure hitting against them to grow strong. 
Plants in that way are anti-fragile. The, pr the stress of the wind actually makes them strong. And the church, here's the, here's the, the way it relates. The church is anti-fragile. The church is anti-fragile. Meaning the things when people are like, did you know, did you hear, when they slander or they attack, and, it, and as Peter says, when it happens, it actually uh, gives growth to the church. The things that at, on day one or on the surface look like it's really going to hurt the church, don't. It actually strengthens the church. In, in church history, uh, there are a few examples of this. In the, in the first few centuries of the church, uh, what happened is there's a bit sickness went through the Roman Empire and Christians got a reputation of taking care of the sick and not just their own, but the sick that had been deserted. People are like, oh man, they're really sick. We're leaving town or we're not going to, we're not going to deal with them. We're not going to help them. Christians, we see, got the reputation of just always helping them. And there was a, uh, an emperor at the time, a Roman emperor named by the name of Julian that wrote in a letter and we have this letter in history. And this is what he wrote. Christianity has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered this to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead, meaning people would die, like not just people who were sick, but people who died. And like, we'll take care of the body. We'll bury them. It is a scandal. There is not a single Jew who is a beggar and he says Jew in the sense that a lot of the early Christians were Jews. So he's not really making a distinction. And that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. So he's the emperor and he's like, oh, like all these people are becoming Christians. And it's, they're becoming Christians because they're doing this. Now notice... Emperor Julian is not a Christian. His historic name is Julian the Apostate. He hates it. He's the people, oh, these Christians. But other people, while the heat is on and while the Roman Empire are persecuting Christians, they're like, I don't know, they seem pretty good to me. Nobody would touch my dad, but they buried him. It's like they saw it and people were converting in droves. Or another example, Tert Tertullian said this famous quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Meaning when people are dying for their faith, it was like seed and it grew up and became a beautiful tree. And what would happen is, you guys have all seen um, just images from Rome and how they would have uh, the gladiator ring and people would be thrown in there with animals. Well, when the Christians were being persecuted, Christians would be thrown in there with the animals. And thousands and thousands of people would come to watch Christians being thrown to the animals or thrown to the lions and thrown to bears and that have been intentionally starved, so they're very hungry. And there are stories throughout church history where they would go and together they would sing hymns praising God while before and during death. So again, think of what Peter says, like, there are some people that are really against it. You, you have to really be against someone to put them in that situation. I don't know if you know that. It's a pretty obvious statement. It's like you have to be pretty against them. But then other people are like, wait a second, what's going on? I would never sing like that. I could never have joy in that situation. I could never hold up my head high in that situation. They, they don't fear death. I'm terrified of death. And the church is anti-fragile. That even if we got to that place, and, and there are some places in the world that are in that place, that people see it, and they're like, there's something different. And what is meant to squell shit makes it grow stronger. So the church, as citizens, as citizens, we silence critics by love, by loving like Jesus. The last point is this, citizens love the least of these. Citizens love the least of these. In Matthew 25, 31 through 40, Jesus gives a picture of the very end of judgment day. And this is what he says. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. 
Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from uh, the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink, and I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirst, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So on, on Judgment Day, God is, is, is using this imagery of like a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. Those who are saved and those who are not. Those who are Christians and those who are not. He's separating the sheep from the goats. And one of the distinctives, this, these aren't the only distinctives because we, we read the Bible in the context of all the Bible. There are other distinctives. But one of the distinctives is you took care of the least of these. You took care of the least of these. And what has been shocking to me is I've been thinking about that, that future day. I'm like, but Jesus, they seem surprised. And I'm wondering why they're surprised because we have, we have this verse, <laughs> you know, of like, why would we be surprised? You told us this would happen. I think they're surprised because they didn't realize the degree by which this was true. So we know this verse. We like we're, it's like we read it. We just read it. But I don't think we even realize the degree by which loving the least of these is loving God. So we're just shocked. Just like, when did we do this? <laughs> like, we just don't, it's an extreme degree. It's like, God, oh, you were watching that, God? You saw that? He's like, yeah, I saw that. That applies? Yeah, that applies. But again, as we see this, and as we see the way this might be lived out, again, two ditches arise for a Christian. The first being the social gospel, and the second being the distorted gospel. Now, what is the social gospel? It's, it's a little bit, of, I'll be honest, it's a little bit of a theological term. And what it means is it, it derives from about 100 years ago and is still going on today is some people say what the gospel is, is doing the things listed here in Matthew 25. That's what the gospel is. The good news is that people should do that. They should feed the hungry. They should give water to those who are thirsty. They, they should clothe the naked. They should visit. They should love the least of these. That's the gospel. And that is not the gospel. That is fruit of the gospel. That is fruit of what is, is going on. And again, a part of the good deeds are not just what are done with hands, but what is done with our mouth as well. It, it's uh, attributed to Francis of Assisi, but he probably never said this. But, but it's a quote that says, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. Like, he probably never said that, but even if he did, Sorry, Francis, he was awesome, but he was wrong on that. Like, you actually have to use words to communicate the gospel. The, the idea of the, of the social gospel, that those things is what encapsulates the gospel, is just not true. They're fruit of the gospel, meaning if, when people understand that and accept it and believe it, those things are byproducts. So that brings us to what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Now, there are many different ways that we see the gospel communicated in scripture, but you could really just summarize it with four words, God, man, Christ, and faith. God, man, Christ, and faith. Meaning there's a God who created everything. Everything you see before you, he made it. And this God is perfect. And he's perfectly loving and he's perfectly just in everything that he does. And we as people, are made in his image. That's why you see so many good things in, in people. But each and every one of us has rebelled against God, what the Bible calls sin. We've known, 
within our own conscience, with, within our own hearts, that we knew what was right and we have done what is wrong. We knew what it was loving and we went the other way. We knew what was just and we went the other way. We have rebelled against God. And because God is just, he will punish our rebellion. So the state of all men, it says in, in John 3, that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. But the reason why that's true is because the world is already condemned. He didn't have to come to condemn it. It's That's our natural state. It's like that's where we're at. We're all running against God. And Jesus comes to change that. So that brings us to our third word, Christ. God could just give us all justice now. He could give us all he, uh, because we reject what is eternally love, he could give us eternally the opposite of that, which is hell. But because he loves us, he sends his one and only son, and it, Jesus, and his one and only son lives the perfect life on our behalf. He lives the perfect life that we should have lived. And uh, there, we could spend all day talking about what Jesus did, but it culminates at what he does on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus takes all of our sin upon him and he is punished for it. He takes the punishment that we deserve. And in this, in dying for it, resurrecting, conquering death, conquering sin, and resurrecting, giving us life, offering life, what he does is he shows that he is both loving and just. He offers that we can be reunified with God, that we can know God again, that we don't have to remain in our rebellion. But he also shows that he's just. He does something with our rebellion. He does something with sin. And then it comes back to our response. What is our response? The wrong answer is just be a really good... See all the things that he listed in Matthew 25? Just try really hard at that stuff. <laughs> that's, that's the wrong answer. You know, time and time again throughout the Bible... It, be, it says, not by what you have done, not by your works. That's the fruit of the works. It's the fruit of the works, as it says, of uh, those he, who he prepared for from the foundation of the world. <laughs> so he prepared from the foundation of the world for his people to do those things. Our response is not our works, but faith. Instead of trusting myself, I trust in God. I trust in what he has done on the cross for my sins. Instead of rejecting it by trusting myself and what I do, I accept it by trusting what he has done. Christians communicate that to people. And if you're a Christian, you should communicate. That's a part of the good deeds, is communicate, not just with your hands, but with your mouth. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, what it means to become a Christian is to accept those things, to believe those things, to respond to those things, to love those things. Now that, the social gospel rejects that. Like, no, you don't need that. You need it. <laughs> you, you need it desperately. But then there are people that are like, you know what? We can just keep our mouth, forget about our hands, forget about our feet, forget about the rest of everything, and just, just communicate it. And you can't do that either. And the reason why you can't do that is it distorts the entire message. You say God is loving and just, but you don't love. You don't care about justice. You say that man, God is, uh, loves the world and is going to change the world, but I don't see any change in your life. You say that Jesus loved us so much to become a part of what's going on, but you don't become a part of what's going on. It distorts the message. It makes the word seem empty. And God can still use it to save people. He loves saving people. But it's like giving people the right words but with our life changing the definition of those words. And we want our lives to reflect the true meaning of each word, God, man, Christ, faith. Our life should reflect it. Our life should help get, provide meaning and definition to those words. So with that all in mind, it's like that gospel lived out as citizens, what we do is we love the least of these even the hardest that are to love, even though nobody else will. We love the least of these. I want to end with some action steps, some very clear action steps. 
And in your booklets, you'll see that each each of the guiding principles give action steps. Uh, I'll be honest, on this one, with, uh, I can't remember, on one of them, you'll see a typo. Uh, yeah, we're, we'll figure it out. But, uh, so here are the action steps for this one. Individual, work hard at your job every day. That's the action step. <laughs> show up early. Tomorrow, show up early. Leave late. Have a good attitude. Make your boss thankful that they employed you. Unless they're like telling you to steal something, then make them bad, sad. You know, it's like, but it's like actually work at your job. We need to recover what the, the reformers called a vocation. And vocation means that all of life is a calling. God has called us to live this life. And if you're a baker, that is a calling before God. And if it's to help people sell pizzas, that is a calling for your job. And if it's to sell docs, that is a calling for, for your life. And if it's to help people get drugs, and the good kind of drugs, it's, that's a great thing. Like, it, it's loving your neighbor, loving your neighbor, loving your coworkers. The next one is this, community. Bless Rhode Island by volunteering, starting and building businesses, participating in social activities, and anything else. It's like, okay, we'll cover all the territory that leads to human thriving. We are like ambassadors. We, we have dual citizenship. And we want, uh, we stand with two feet on both sides, or one feet, you, you get what I'm saying, a foot on both sides. Well, that's where we stand, and we want it to transfer over. We want to bring, uh, bring things into this world through every activity of our life. And then lastly, as a family, actually get to know your neighbors as a family. Do you know your neighbors' names? Do you know what they care about? I, just this week, I had some new neighbors move in across the street. I was painting my, my porch, and I, I have proof because there's a little bit of paint on my dog's back. <laughs> I noticed it yesterday. I'm like, oops. <laughs> but it's, and I saw a moving truck pull up. I saw them trying to move a couch up the stairs that there's no way it was going to get in. And I decided to help anyways. And it got stuck. And then we moved it out. But it's it just a new family. They're Jordanian immigrants. It was just wonderful to connect with them and just get to know them for the first time. And they have a son. That's the age of our sons. And it's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to what Doris and might open. Just, getting, just get to know your neighbors as a family and just see what God does with it. Sometimes it'll take a long time. Usually it'll take a long time. But isn't it a gift to represent God, to be citizens in this world, and to make things a better place for everyone? Let's pray.